Today I am going to share how I painted the zebra and beehive painting in acrylics. Before we get started on the painting, I just wanted to let you guys know if you have been watching or listening to me talk about my little dart frogs in our weekly live streams, make sure to watch all the way to the end of this video where I will be sharing an update with these guys. If you are supporters over on Patreon, make sure to head over there where I've got, th this is broken up into three parts, hours and hours of video footage on this lesson. If you are unfamiliar with Patreon for as little as $4 a month, you get access to all of my weekly one to two, sometimes three hour long tutorials. I have over 200 available for you to watch right now in multiple mediums. You can head over to my Patreon video library if you would like to see what it is that I have to offer there. You also get a little sample of what my Patreon videos are like, so you can find out if you think that is going to be a fit for you. For this painting, I am working on a Fredericks Convexo canvas. These are round canvases with beveled edges. And just for transparency, I am sponsored by Fredericks. They were already the only canvas I used, so no real difference for me there, other than I now tell you I'm sponsored by Fredericks. But anyway, this is a Convexo canvas. Now these canvases have a little bit more tooth than what I like for getting a lot of detail, a lot of tiny detail, which obviously I need to do in this painting. So what I do is I apply a couple of coats, uh, two to three coats of Liquitex Gesso, and then sand it with about a 200 and, I don't remember what it is, 230, 220. I think it's a 220 grit sandpaper, something around there. It doesn't have to be exact. But I sand it so that I get this really smooth surface, and this is going to allow me to use the convexo canvas, which I love, but get the tiny, tiny detail very easily. So I started with painting my canvas a dark gray and then used a white charcoal pencil to draw my zebra out. Now I'm going to paint everything in like the bees aren't even there and the honeycomb. I'm not even going to worry about that. I will uh, add that in later. Now, one of the things that I used to do when I, I first learned to blend with acrylics is that I would over blend everything. So a big tip I have for you is don't over blend stuff. It's okay if your brush strokes show and it actually, in my opinion, looks better in many cases. So let that work as added detail, added texture to your painting. And when I say texture, I don't mean physical texture, like you can't touch it, it's completely smooth, but visual texture. It adds a lot, it looks like you've added a ton of detail without actually adding a ton of detail. The shine on the eye there. So I try to break things down into smaller sections as I work. I'm not jumping all over the place. That was a big thing for me to learn when I first started working with acrylics. I would try to kind of paint everything at once, like all the white stripes, all every layer was done all at the same time. And it made it very hard to tackle. And I had a tendency to rush through the work. Now that I blend or layer work on, I can't talk, work on small sections at a time, this allows me to really focus on tiny little details that I was really rushing over before. It took me many years to figure that out, just break it down into small sections. And in my head, I was thinking, well, I have to do it all at once. I have to do all the base layer all at once and then the next layer all at once, or it won't blend smoothly. The thing is, it doesn't need to blend smoothly. As you can see here, where I'm intentionally letting my brush stroke show, that can look really good. Now I'm using unbleached titanium white to go through, and I just painted the everywhere the, the white portions of this guy is going to be. Just painted that with unbleached titanium white. You could use titanium white as well. It doesn't really matter because we're going to put so many layers on top of it later on. But I just blocked that out and blocked in a few purple highlights for where the highlights are going to be on the black. Not a big concern at this stage because I am going to go back and do a lot of detail. But that made it easy for me to kind of judge where everything was going to go when I get to it. Now I'm going to focus just on this area here. Now my main focus at this point are getting my lights and my darks where they need to be. Get those values correct. Don't worry about the color. The color is not a big deal. That is something that you can adjust as you move forward. But people have a tendency to think that the reason that their work doesn't look realistic enough is that they just don't know which color to use. If somebody would just tell me the color to use, I can tell you the color I used, but if you just use that one color, you have a flat cartoon. It still doesn't look realistic. The thing that will make your work look realistic is paying attention to your lights and your darks. And that's what I'm doing here. Yeah, I've got some of the reddish browns or the, the I think I've mixing some red oxide with black to get that brownish tone. But 
it doesn't have to be exact. And I can layer and glaze and intense that later as needed. What I want to pay attention to is one, getting that texture. I'm letting those brush strokes show yet again, but where are my lights? Where are my darks? Which edges should be soft? Which one should be harsh? Those are the things that matter more. And that's, what's going to make a big difference in your work look, looking very realistic. Think of how many times you see photorealistic or hyper-realistic black and white paintings and drawings. The color didn't matter. It would, there wasn't even any color. Don't focus on the color as being the reason that you're having a hard time making your work look realistic. Focus on your values. Now, yeah, color matters. It's just not to the extent that most people think it does. And usually it's beginners who are like just hyper focused on if I only knew which color to, to use, which paintbrush to use, which everything. None of that stuff is that big of a deal. Get your values in there. Light's light enough, dark's dark enough, and that will make such a difference in your work. Now here, I am tinting the color of the white like crazy. I've got some red oxide in there. I've got some magenta and just smudging those out. I'm paying attention to, again, where are my lights? Where are my darks? My reference photo, and it did not have these purples and reds and oranges in there at all, but these are going to really make a difference in, in that work. I'm going to, I'm pretty much hyping up my color saturation. So again, we can go back to that lesson I was just talking about. Color is not a big deal. Are my values right? Are my darks dark enough? My lights light enough? Is my drawing accurate? These things matter much more. And here I get to take some artistic liberties and really hype up that color saturation. Now, another tip I have for you, when you are painting short fur, I mean, these guys have super, super short fur. This photograph I believe was taken in the summer, so really short fur. They don't try to force every single strand of fur in there, even if you're trying to make it look realistic. When you look at them you're, with the naked eye, you don't see every strand of fur. You see hints of fur here and there, just a few brush strokes. And you'll see me do that just a little bit in between some of the black and white stripes where there's just like right there, just a hint of fur, not a lot. I'm not putting fur everywhere, just getting a little bit in there. If you sit there with a paintbrush, even with a tiny, tiny paintbrush, and try to add in every little strand of fur, you end up giving it a weird texture. It doesn't look like fur anymore. It almost looks like a weird plastic model or a wire-haired zebra, which nobody wants. You can really see now what a difference adding in these purples and, and brown tones would make if this was just solid titanium white or unbleached titanium white, which is what I had used here, it would be very, very flat. And the goal is to make them look more three-dimensional. So we've got to pay attention to those. Again, light's light enough, dark's dark enough. We want that high contrast. And I like to generally hype that contrast up. So I will hype up my color saturation. Well, as you can tell, I've got magentas and orange tones in there that really aren't on my, weren't on my reference photo. But I also will hype up my, my value or the, just the contrast in general, make my lights a little bit brighter, my darks a little bit darker. And it, it pulls out a lot of dimension in the piece. So same thing, I'm just glazing. And what a glaze is, if you're unfamiliar with that, I'm, I'm using paint that is thinned down quite a bit with water, so it's very translucent. I can still see all of the brush strokes that I did underneath it, but I'm tinting the color. Think of a window tint. It just shifts the color a bit, but you can still see through it. You can still see everything underneath. Now, the thing with, with doing glazes is that you don't want to use really opaque paint. So I'm not going to glaze with titanium white or, or yellow. My yellow oxide with the Liquitex Basics is very opaque. So they aren't the best colors for or best paints for glazing with. I like the ones that are more translucent. That's actually one of the reasons that I prefer Liquitex Basics over, let's say, Liquitex Heavy Body or the Soft Body paints. Those paints, one, they dry way too fast for my, my taste. I don't like how fast those paints dry. The Liquitex Basic stays wet a bit longer, which makes it easier to blend things out. But the other thing is that the Liquitex Basics tend to be a bit thinner or they, they're not as highly pigmented. They're not as opaque. And for me, because I build in layers and do a lot of glazing, that's a big deal. They work better for my techniques and they're just as, as archival as far as being light fast. I choose light fast colors. So there's no issue with my work not being archival because I'm using what is actually a cheaper paint. The Liquitex Basics don't cost as much as the heavy body or the soft body paints, which is funny because I've had people ask me that. Why are you using the cheap ones? I'm not using them because they're cheap. I'm just using them because they work really well for my techniques. And again, they are light fast, which is a big deal to me in my work. 
Another tip I have for you is when you're painting things that are black and white, so in this case I've got both, white is not white, black is not black. You're not gonna leave things solid white or black. Your white is going to be reserved for your brightest, brightest highlights, your actual titanium white, which is pretty much the shine in the eye. Like you don't really have that much straight titanium white. The same thing with the black. The black is not going to be left flat black. If you do that, you've got a cartoon. It's very flat. Look at all the blues and purples that I've added. And then I've got the actual black for the darkest areas. Now, some people will say, just don't use black paint at all. I'm personally a huge fan of black paint, but I don't leave it just flat black. I will typically paint or glaze other colors over it, which is what gives me a lot of depth. That blue makes such a difference in making the orange pop. So what I did to come up with the design on where I wanted the honeycomb is I imported this, this photo once this section was done into Photoshop and then I used, well, I just Photoshopped beehives into it to figure out like how far do I want those honeycombs to come down on the white areas or do I want it on the white and the black? I wasn't sure. So by playing around with that in Photoshop, it gave me an idea on what I thought would look nice. How how far do I want this coming down on his the front of his head versus just his neck? So that makes it a very, it's just such a useful tool for designing your artwork. So now I'm just blocking these in and this is a rinse and repeat. I did not record all of this because it is it was very tedious, hours and hours and hours of drawing out little shapes here. So I'm using some raw sienna just to get my base layer. And then I'm going to use magentas mixed in with that magenta. And I'm trying to think, I think I used a little bit of, of yellow mixed in to tone it down, or maybe it was just mixed with the raw sienna. I painted this months ago. I don't actually remember. Um, if I had to do it again, those are probably the colors that I would use. But that is how I'm getting this this darker area. And the goal here is the same as everywhere else. Where are my lights? Where are my darks? I don't want the inside of this honeycomb just to be one solid color. It'll look flat. So you can see areas where it's just the raw umber and then the areas where I've mixed in magenta. I'm pretty sure that's just magenta and raw umber. And then I'm going to come through with the highlights, which make it look really shiny. Or I'm going to take a break. It looks like I'm taking a break. I guess I could get it, edit that out. There we go. Should be back to painting now. So now I'm coming through with some of these highlights and I'm using transparent mixing white for a lot of this. So it's light, but again, translucent, whereas the titanium white, which is what I'm using here, is going to be my very, very opaque white. It really, I mean, that stuff, you don't see through that at all. But it gives me a bit of a transition between the kind of glazed look, the, I, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, frosty? I don't know, but I, they're bees. They don't want frost. But I'm, I've got that transition where it's more of a translucent white. You can still see the color beneath it and then that brightest, bold, shiny white. The transparent mixing white is a great paint too. I will use that like for the glaze or the shine on the eye. The brightest dot on the eye, that's just titanium white. But that bluish tint where it gives that glassy look, that is my, my transparent mixing white mixed with some of the purple and blue. And I use that on eye, pretty much every painting where I'm painting eyes. That's a bit redundant. But every time I'm painting eyes, that is the paint that I go for is that transparent mixing white to get that glossy look. And then of course the titanium white for the brightest highlight. So I had to come in between the honeycombs, clean that up a little bit. So that was with my unbleached titanium white. And I'm using a synthetic hog haired liner brush there. That one is from Hobby Lobby. They're generic master's touch. I'm not a huge fan of most generic art supplies, but I love their paint brushes. The generic, again, the, I think they're called Master's Touch. They're fairly inexpensive. They go on sale every three weeks or so, and they are so good. But that synthetic hog haired liner, I've not found an equivalent that I like as much as that brush. Now I'm going to paint in my little bees. I'm just gonna start solid where the black and the yellow go, and then I can come back through with my shading. And these guys are pretty tiny, so I don't have a ton of detail in there. 
from a distance, you're not going to see that detail anyway. It's mainly the zebra and the honeycomb that you're going to focus on. So I don't need to put a lot in these guys. Their little wings. Adding some bluish purple tones. I think it's both blue and purple mixed together for that color. Just because that was the same paint that I had used all over the zebra. So we'll pull that into these guys as well. And when I do these surreal type paintings, I look at it more as a collage. I've had people ask all the time how I come up with these ideas. Honestly, it's a collage. I like zebras. I like bees. How can I combine them? If you think of it in those terms, it's actually very easy to come up with surreal ideas. Just combine things, random things that don't belong together. You've seen me do that with the lion where I turned his hair into, or his mane into coral. This is something that I really enjoy doing in my work. And it's not, like, I never feel like it's super, super creative. It's really just me coming up with a collage idea. But the end result, I love the paintings that I, I've done that on. I like them much more than just a painting of a realistic zebra. My, at least to me, it seems like it's something different. Not everybody has this painting. Tons and tons of zebras out there. I've not seen one quite like this. So it's really fun to make something that's a bit unique where you're just combining two completely different subjects together. So as promised, here is an update on my little Santa Isabel dart frogs. These are the same kind that Cletus, Cletus Quadonkadonk is. We've talked about this a lot in the live streams that I've been planning for months to get him some buddies. And I finally got some. These ones came from Josh's frogs. And this is day one of me putting them in their new vivarium. So this vivarium has been set up for many, many, many months um, before I... Well, I actually had to, as many of you know, had to tear it down because where I got it from did not put a, a separation layer between. We talked about that before. The dirt was all nasty. I had to fix up some stuff on it. But then it was set up for months beyond that too. So now we are going to set free these adorable teeny, 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 tiny, like seriously, look how tiny they are. I want to make sure they don't jump forward. They are really fast. I always joke that, that Cletus teleports. He doesn't jump. He just instantly appears somewhere else. So this, it was the smallest, I believe, of the bunch. You can see with my, next to my fingers in comparison, so tiny. The other two, I can't actually tell here. This maybe wasn't the smallest one, but the other two, they definitely eat a bit more. They all eat. I've watched them all eat, but the other two have eaten so much since I got them. They're growing really fast. These Gwens, I believe they were three to four months old, it said when I ordered them. Here's another little one. Now, right now, they are brownish in tone with that kind of yellowy tone stripe. As they get older, that yellowy tone stripe will be more of a lime green, a, kind of a whitish lime green, very pale lime green, I should say. And the brown will turn more of a wine red. There's the biggest of all of them. That one is Benedict. I'm not sure if Benedict is male or female, but its name is Benedict. And once they get older, they'll, I'll, the way that I'll, main way I'll be able to tell male from female is that the males will bark. You guys have heard Cletus chirping during the live stream. So I'm hoping that there's a few more males than females in this bunch so that they all get along and I don't end up having to separate anybody. But there they are in their new little home. These guys eat wingless fruit flies that I breed. Yeah, it seems like such a weird thing. I braid fruit flies, but that is what they're eating. They're dusted with their vitamin mix or calcium plus. And I left my camera out so I could record them eating. What surprised me to find is that they can get a little bit aggressive with each other over the food. So I've, I'm glad that I recorded that because I didn't realize they weren't doing it in front of me when I watched them. So I now know to sprinkle when I put in a new batch of fruit flies, I'm spreading that throughout the vivarium so everybody can eat some without, you know, having a little boxing match. The orange thing that you see, or I guess yellow, I don't know what color it's coming up as, um, in the middle there, that is just a piece of mango that I put for the fruit flies to eat. And it also, they kind of hover around that area and it makes it really easy for the frogs to find their, their next meal. I 
spend a ridiculous amount of time watching them. Anyway, there we go. There is our update on these guys. The third one is in the back of the vivarium. And so I've been having to put fruit flies back there. That one, both of these two seem to be a little bit aggressive towards. So if they keep up their little attitude, I'll put the small one in the tank that Cletus is in. And then Cletus can come in with when Cletus is ready with those guys. See, see how they jump at each other? Like it's not a horrible fight, but they're definitely letting each other know who's in charge of the feeding station there. Have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy button right there. It's round has an orange arrow going towards it. If you click on that, that'll help you to keep up to date with all of my new art videos every single week and my live streams. You may also want to click on the notification bell because YouTube has been horrible lately about letting people know when my videos go live or when the live stream starts. So that will help too.